Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The purpose of the circular scrub method of toothbrushing is to dislodge and remove bacterial plaque and debris from the surfaces of the teeth and the free gingiva. Multi-tufted soft toothbrushes should be used. The bristles are generally made of nylon, six thousandth to nine thousandth inches in diameter, and eleven thirty-second to fifteen thirty-second inches in length. There are 18 to 50 tufts in the brush, with 30 to 100 filaments in each tuft. The bristles have a resilient interaction as demonstrated with a dental probe. There is adequate space between the tufts of the bristles for cleaning the brush. The brush shown in this movie has longer bristles in the mid portion and shorter bristles toward the edges. This, however, is not an essential feature of a multi-tufted toothbrush. The ends of the bristles are blunt to prevent injury to the gingival tissues during brushing. Note the resilient action of the bristles when tested with the finger. The toothbrush should be held in a firm and secure grip. However, one should be able to rotate the handle so that the brush can be easily directed toward the various surfaces of the teeth. The bristles of the brush are kept perpendicular to the surfaces of the teeth and the surrounding gingival tissues. They should extend one to two millimeters apical to the free gingival margin, but definitely not to the mucogingival line. The circular scrub movements of the toothbrush are demonstrated. The brush acts on two to three teeth at the same time. With a continuous circular scrubbing movement, the brush is slowly brought forward to engage new areas. The action of the brush is shown in detail in this close-up view. The main portion of the brush contacts the teeth rather than the gingival tissues. The marginal gingiva, however, should be included in the brushing, as demonstrated on the right posterior maxillary teeth of this model. The circular scrub method will now be demonstrated on a patient. The same sequence of brushing that was shown on the typodont will be followed. The surfaces of the teeth is illustrated in the maxillary right quadrant. Care should be observed not to place too much pressure on the brush, or the tips of the bristles will not function well. This method of toothbrushing, correctly employed, removes dental and intracravicular plaque. This method includes both the use of the toothbrush and dental floss, but this film will demonstrate only the toothbrushing part of the bass technique. A multi-tufted brush such as right kind or similar type is used. The tufts of the bristles should end in a slightly rounded tip, and the end of each bristle should be blunt. Note the separation between the bundles of bristles to facilitate cleaning the toothbrush. The bristles are resilient, and each bristle is about seven thousandth of an inch in diameter. The blunt end of the bristles is a safeguard against injury. The toothbrush should be held in a firm grip with all the fingers. 
The brush can be rotated in the hand to provide access to various areas of the mouth. Proper placement and action of the brush will now be demonstrated on the typodont. The brush is placed at approximately a 45 degree angle to the teeth, with the bristles pointing apically. Part of the brush covers the buccal surfaces of the teeth, while other bristles extend over the occlusal surfaces. The bristles penetrate into the gingival crevice, while the brush handle is being moved in small rotary or vibratory movements without actually changing positions of the tips of the individual bristles. Several teeth may be covered simultaneously by the brush while it is gradually moved from one area of the dentition to another. Proper brush position and bristle action is illustrated in this close-up of the distal buccal aspect of the last maxillary molar. The bass method of toothbrushing will now be demonstrated on a patient. Brushing is started at the buccal aspect of the right maxillary molars. The brush is first placed on the teeth and the bristles allowed to slide into the gingival crevice. Small vibratory movements are made. Note the blanching of the gingival tissues in response to the pressure of the ends of the bristles. In order to clean an area of gingival recession, it may be necessary to change the position of the brush so the bristles can be worked into the gingival crevice and clean the entire exposed tooth surface. As a result of previous faulty tooth brushing, this patient has experienced some gingival recession. In spite of the rigorous but faulty tooth brushing, she has not been able to keep her teeth free of plaque. Areas of gingival recession and irregularities of gingival contour may require special modifications of tooth brushing in order to accomplish complete plaque removal. It is important that the brush is placed in the correct position to reach into the gingival crevice on the lingual aspect of the posterior mandibular teeth without interference from the tongue. The bristle should also be directed into the gingival crevice on the lingual aspect of the mandibular anterior teeth. The brush should not be pulled forward because the bristles will bend and cannot enter the gingival crevice. Proper action of the brush may also be achieved with the lower incisor teeth separating the bristles, as long as the bristles are allowed to enter into the gingival crevice. Dental floss is used for the removal of interproximal plaque, both supra and subgingivally. The typical location of interproximal plaque can be seen in this mouth after the application of a disclosing solution. Notice that the labial surfaces of the teeth are relatively clean, while there is an abundance of stainable plaque bordering the interdental papillae. Interproximal plaque is removed easily with dental floss. A floss holder may be used to position and facilitate the action of the floss. The dental floss cleans both the exposed and interproximal cravicular surfaces of the teeth. The floss may also be held between the fingers.
Dental floss is usually held between the fingers instead of using an instrument. About 18 inches of the floss are cut off. One end of the floss is wrapped several times around the right middle finger. The other end is wrapped around the left middle finger. When the thumbs can be pointed together and touch with the hand stretched out, the correct working length of the floss has been established. The floss can be directed with the right forefinger and the left thumb, or the floss may be held between the right thumb and the left forefinger in a similar manner. This assures good control of the dental floss. A third finger position is to hold the dental floss between both forefingers. This position is used for all mandibular teeth. The distance between the fingers should be about one third of an inch. For the right maxillary segment, the dental floss is held between the right thumb and the left forefinger with the thumb on the buccal side as shown in this view. The proper finger and floss positions for the cuspid area are to hold the thumb labially and the forefinger palatally. The same finger position is used for the distal surface of the lateral incisor. The use of the dental floss in the left maxillary quadrant can now be seen. The left thumb is positioned buccally and the right forefinger palatally. The same finger position and movement pattern may be used for the mesial side of the bicuspid and remaining posterior teeth. The floss must be held between the two forefingers to reach the distal aspect of the right mandibular molar. Notice the sawing movement that is used to get the floss past the tight contact between the first and second molars. The hands are merely brought forward to use the floss on the distal surface of the lower first molar. The sweeping cleaning action is repeated several times. The finger position and the use of dental floss in the lower anterior segment is shown by first flossing the mesial surface of the lower right cuspid. A slightly changed finger position is indicated for the distal surface of the adjacent lateral incisor. The correct finger position and use of floss for the left mandibular quadrant are shown. Observe the position of the fingers, how the floss is held, and the sewing action that is used. This same finger position is maintained for flossing the mesial surface of the bicuspid. Dental floss is an important aid in oral hygiene for everyone and should be used routinely once a day. This is especially true where the interdental papillae have been lost or interproximal fillings are present. It is mandatory for cleaning under bridge pontics. Notice how the floss is passed through the interproximal space and under the bridge pontic. Proper use of the toothbrush and dental floss combined will provide adequate oral hygiene for most individuals. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of